no greater name. And we're going to be talking about that today and as the children are leaving and I'm going to go ahead and show you what's going to happen with these in a minute. I'm, I'm going to, this is kind of an experiment. I've done it with other things besides spoons before. And uh, I'm going to glue these two together. What's that? Double portion. Maybe I should, just in case. So I'm going to glue these together, and I'm going to hold them together just for a second. Because it only says it takes 10 seconds. By the way, it's Gorilla Glue, you know. It's not that old-fashioned super glue stuff. It's Gorilla Glue. I don't know if you guys remember, but I remember when I was a kid when some of that stuff came out. I just wanted to make sure it worked. And I'd get it all over my hands. And it would stick all over me, and then I wouldn't be able to get my fingers apart. Because I wasn't a real smart kid. I just like to play with stuff. And so uh, today, though, we're going to talk about Jesus is a glue that holds everything together. All right. Now, the problem is we start falling apart, not because of where Jesus is, but because where we are. All right. So God never changes. He's always the same. God's never different. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we can count on that. The problem is you and I change our position with him. All right. And what we ought to do is allow God to surround us, encompass us, and glue us together. All right. Now, I've just happened to notice that these things don't fit real well. So this may not work as, as good. Uh, I like to use flat pieces because they're a little better to glue together, but I didn't have any, and I, it just hit me I need to do this today. So if this fails, here in a little while in the sermon, I'll still talk about how it's supposed to work, okay? And so, I'm going to have a couple guys come forward, or at least one guy come forward in a little bit. I already warned him, and I think he thought I was going to use these on him or something, and didn't want to come. We're going to go to Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15 today. As we're in God's word today and we want to look at starting with verse 15 and go on down in the chapter and then go to one other passage in Romans. It says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. All right now that's a pretty powerful statement. Matter of fact Christ is the visible image of everything that God is. And, you, and I know most of you right now are sitting here going but I've never seen Jesus. Folks, I want to tell you, we saw in the case of Christ that he cannot be denied. We saw in that movie and, the, and all the work that was done in, in that era to try to figure that out, we figured out that too many people had seen him. Too many people had talked about it. Matter of fact, well over 500 had seen him after he rose again. And God's word says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He exists before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Did you ever think about you and I are just these little bitty specks in this world? You know, we think we're so important. But when you really think about it, we just are these little specks. Matter of fact, we're only here from somewhere between 70 and usually 100 and some years. Think about that compared to eternity. Some of you remember over a year and a half ago when I preached a revival here in March. Before coming nine months ago. I had a rope that was several hundred feet long. And a little tip of it, I put tape around. And we focus on this much that represented our lives instead of focusing on all the things of God. God's word tells us in verse 15 that not only is he the visible image of the invisible God, but he was here in the beginning. Which there was no beginning. He's always been here. You say, how in the world can you believe that, preacher? Because God's word says it. I can believe it. Because, see, you have to have faith to believe in God. 
But let me tell you something. Those people that believe in evolution and all those other nutty things have to have a lot of faith in something that doesn't exist. And if you think that man came from a monkey, you need to try some of this glue. All right. Sorry, couldn't resist. Verse 16. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. All right, now we need to understand that in God's word today because not only did he make everything and all things, not only did everything that has ever existed was made by him, not only that, he says even the things, and he doesn't say it here, but you don't know anything about. All those things in the unknown world. The things you and I don't see. There's a lot of us as Baptists that think we can put our head in the sand and if our head's in the sand, all the junk going on around us doesn't exist. Baloney. Sometimes we need to take our head out of the sand so we can see that the enemy's approaching so we understand how to fight the enemy. You see, we forget that there's spiritual warfare going on as it talks about in Ephesians. We forget that there's battles going on and you and I need to know that that we might be prayed up, be God up, that God might do a work in us that we might even storm the gates of hell with a water pistol if that's what it takes. So not only has he made everything we haven't seen, he made everything in the unknown world, he, he mentions such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for what? For him. You and I were created for him. You and I were created to serve him. You and I were created that we might glorify him. 17, it said he, exists, he existed before anything else. And he holds all creation together. He's the glue that holds us together. Verse 18 says, Christ is also the head of the church. Who's the head of the church? Christ. We somehow, sometimes forget who the head is of the church is All right, it folks it's not the deacon body we just met at 8 o'clock they're not trying to run the church alright they're here to support the church and all we do and hopefully family ministries and everything else we're trying to get going they're not here to run the church whatever committee you might serve on is not here to run the church yeah. it's God's house Jesus is the head of the body. Have you noticed even in your own life, I've noticed in mine, when my head turns and looks at something, I can always look away, but when I look back again, if I don't watch myself, I may start going that direction. Have you ever been driving down the road and you start gazing at something, and pretty soon you find yourself going that direction? It happens. But I want to tell you that God is the head of the church. Therefore, when God says and his head turns, you and I need to go that direction. Because that is God moving. Some of the problems we have today is we say, well, God doesn't work that way. Well, who made you smarter than God? I mean, really? Well, I've never seen that before. Well, maybe it's time you see something you haven't seen before. Maybe it's time you start looking at what God wants to do instead of what man's doing. You know, it says, He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead, so He is first in everything. Who's supposed to be first? Not you, not I, not other people. God Himself, Jesus Christ, 
is to be first. In all things, not just some things. You see, we let him be first when it comes to coming to church. We don't let him be first a lot of times in everything else in our lives. Verse 19 says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Man, I wish we had time to break that down to what it probably would be like and look like, but we don't. But I'll just offer this. I want to tell you, I don't know why Christ would have came to start with to live around people like you and I. Knowing that he would suffer, knowing he'd be rejected, knowing he'd be put on a cross of Mount Calvary, and before that, beat half to death. I don't think I could love you guys that much. I'm just being honest here. Don't get so cocky, you probably couldn't either. All right? But the truth of the matter is, God loved us enough. And God's word says he was even pleased to live in Christ. Who was 100% God and 100% man. And died on the cross of Mount Calvary for our sins. Verse 20 says, And through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. You see, it's Christ's blood on the cross that reconciled everything to Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross of Mount Calvary for our sins, we had a way to come to the Father that we didn't have to go through someone else. And now you and I can come to God's throne because of the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sins. The blood of Jesus that as he died upon the cross of Mount Calvary and he said it is finished. He had finished what God had called him to do in that mortal body. Because that body was going away. But praise God he rose again on the third day. Amen. And he sits on the right hand of the Father today. Right. As we go on and Verse 21, it says, this includes you who were once far from God. I know some of you right now saying, I was never that far from God. I accepted Christ as a little child. Hey, you were still dying and going to hell without Jesus. God snatched you out of hell, forgave you you of your sins as wretched and the wretches that we were he loved us that much he goes on to say you were his enemies oh I was never God's enemy that's why I hear a lot of people say oh I'm never God's enemy I'd never do anything against God listen when you don't know Jesus everything you do is against God you got to come to know Jesus and then we even have trouble serving him don't we? Let's be truthful. He says, you were enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. That's one of the things we get in trouble with all the time, isn't it? Our evil thoughts and actions. Well, you know, I didn't mean to do it. Yes, you did. Don't lie to yourself and for heaven's sakes, don't try to lie to God. He's telling you not to do it. He's giving you a way out, and you do it anyway. I want to tell you, even as Christians today, those sins in our life affect our relationship with him. They don't take away our salvation, but they affect our relationship in Christ. The same way that if my wife and I have a fight, it would only be her fight, and I don't believe in that. But anyway, if my wife and I would have a fight... <laughs> <laughs> then yeah I wouldn't be able to say anything anyway so it wouldn't matter but it would not mean we were not married but it would affect our relationship for a while wouldn't it until I went and said I'm so, 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 sorry because I can't say it all in one word because it just I'm a man it doesn't come out that way okay I'm sorry 
You never heard me say that? You did too one time I remember. <laughs> so she just doesn't remember everything. <laughs> but isn't that true? It affects our relationship. So when we're out of the will of God in our life, it affects our relationship with who he is. It doesn't mean we're not saved, but it means we're out of fellowship with God. You see, that's where it comes down. It doesn't mean that we're not going to heaven if we die because if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're going to spend eternity in heaven with him and we'll even find that in the verses here in just a little bit and we'll talk about that. In verse 22 it says, Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in this physical body. As a result... He has brought you into his own presence. You and I are in the presence of Almighty God when we receive him in our hearts as Lord and Savior of our lives. And you are holy. Get this? Think about this one. You, you and me are holy and blameless and you stand before him without a single fault amen. amen not because of what you and I have done but because of what he did on the cross of Mount Calvary for our sins you see because he paid the price we are holy and blameless. Because he paid the price, we stand without a single fault. Then how come we're all so messed up? Really? You say, I have a hard time understanding that about myself, but many times we sit there and think, I definitely don't understand it about so-and-so. Because I know they're messed up. Folks, I want to tell you, when God wipes... Wipes the slate clean. It's clean indeed. Amen. When he forgives, he forgives. And you say, well then why should I have to worry about sinning in my life? Let me tell you, because you want to be right with God. Amen. Because you want to be whole in him. It's not going to affect your salvation. You said, oh good, because I'm going out and sin. I've been wanting to sin a little bit more this week anyway. No, that's not the way it works. You and I are supposed to stay away from sin. You and I are not, not to be drawn to sin. You and I are supposed to be drawn to a holy God and say, God, I'll give you everything in my life. And when I mess up, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to ask you to forgive me and restore that joy. Verse 23 says, But you must continue to believe his truth. And stand firmly in it. If you believe his truth, you will stand firmly in it. See, the problem is, we know God's word says what it says. We open the word of God. We try to apply the word of God. But many times, you and I just can't let some things go. Many times, you and I, and God's word uses this, we return back to the vomit. You say, well, pastor, did you just use that in church? Yeah, God used it in the Bible. Sometimes we like to suffer. We say we don't. But if we wanted to get out of the situations in our life that aren't of God, we'd give them over to God. And we'd quit living that type of lifestyle. You say, well, pastor, I just don't understand that. You don't understand. I've had people tell me before, you don't understand. I've got this gene and it makes me sin. Well. You know, in my younger days, I said, what's the matter? Are they too tight? <laughs> but I've had people sit and tell me, I got this gene. My, my parents had this gene. I want to tell you, it's not about a gene. It's about the blood of Jesus cleansing us. 
Oh, you might have some kind of gene and that may be something in your life. And you say that can be proven. Well, that's fine. But I want to tell you, God can forgive all sin. God can forgive every sin. And God wants you and I to be whole in him and to be one with him in Christ. He says, don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. He said, you all know it. When you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and received the good news in your life, don't drift away. You know what one of the problems we have today, many of us are drifting away because we're doing nothing. When we're talking about drifting, when you're in the water and you're in the boat, the stream has to go somewhere or you're in a lake, all right? But if you're in a river or a stream, that has to go one direction. And if you do nothing, I'm going to tell you where you're going to go. You're going to go downstream. And a lot of Christians today say, I'm saved, that's good enough. Let me tell you, if you're saved, that's when you need to get busy for God. There's nowhere in God's word you can find that tells you just to keep sitting and doing nothing. You just can't find it. He goes on to say, The good news has been preached all over the world. And I, Paul, have been appointed by God's, excuse me, as God's servant to proclaim it. He said, man, I'm preaching it. He said, by God, I've been called. I want to give you something. Everyone in this building has been called. Gabe, would you come down here? This ain't going to work. Don't worry. You're going to have, you're not, you don't have to. It's not going to work. It already came apart. <laughs> yeah. I, I just pulled it apart myself. I, I was going to get two big fat guys. I mean, I was going to get one big fat guy and one, and one muscle man, man down here <laughs> to try to pull this apart. And hopefully it wouldn't pull apart. I know to use what I used before to do this. But it makes the same point here. I can pull these apart. But you want to know something? When God puts something together, there's no man can pull it apart. You can either trust in a gorilla. Or you can trust in God. I mean, it's easy as that. You can trust in the gorilla and trust in God. And, and I've used this passage of scripture we're going to before, but in Romans 8, 38, I've used it in the whole passage here in the sermon in May, matter of fact. But I, I'm going to tell you, these verses here, I use them all the time. When, when somebody comes to me that doesn't know Jesus and doesn't believe in God, I go through a modified Roman road with them. And I love these verses when I come to them. Because they're so meaningful. Because God's word says, now remember this. What man can do isn't worth much. What God can do is worth everything. He says in Romans chapter 8 verse 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. All right. Now listen, he doesn't stop right there. He goes on, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Amen. Amen. Verse 39 says, no power in the sky above or in the earth below indeed. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Who can separate us? No one. What can separate us? Nothing. Nothing. Is there anything can separate us from the love of God? No. 
Why don't we proclaim it? Why don't we live it? Why don't we live our lives like nothing can separate us from the love of God and be faithful to God in all that we do and come before him in everything we do and give God all the glory? Don't you think it's about time we finally say, enough is enough, Satan, you're not going to get those victories in my life anymore. I'm going to hold on to God with all that I am because I know he's got a hold on me and he'll never let go. The problem is many times we think God's letting go. It's not God letting go, it's us trying to get away. We need to understand we need to hold on to him, but he's got a hold on you and I. Nothing can and will ever separate us from God's love. So now I want you just for a second to think about our own lives. Are we feeling all that joy that God says we're going to have when we serve him? If not, it's not God. It's us. Will we give it back to him? Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I remember a day when I was on fire for God. Then I'm going to ask you, why don't you make that today again? Maybe you're here today, though, and you don't know my Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. I want to tell you, there's no other way to heaven but by the blood of Jesus. And he died on the cross for your sins that you might be saved. Would you come and accept him in your heart and life today? Ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he'll forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Remember, God's word says we stand before him holy, blameless, without fault. It's because of what he has done. Now I know some of you right now, you're thinking there's some fault in my life. And I know there's some sin in my life. And I'm just not at the point of getting rid of that I'm going to ask you today please bring it to him please lay it at the altar at Jesus feet and be renewed in him once again where I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment we're going to pray and then I'm going to ask you to come as the music sings and the musicians start playing and singing would you just step out and come today Maybe you see today in God's word everything that he's done for us and you said, wow, I just haven't been who I'm supposed to be in him. I need to get right with God. As a matter of fact, sometimes apathy sets in. Sometimes I just don't care. Sometimes I get aggravated because everything doesn't go my way. I want you to just come and give that over to God today. Some of you got sin in your life that you know. You know that God's been working on you. And you don't want to give it up. Because to you, it is important. I want to tell you what's important to God is that you love him enough to give it up. And give it to him. If you don't know my Jesus, would you come and receive him today? If you know him today, would you come and get right with him? Maybe you have lost ones that are lost going to hell and you need to be praying and interceding for them that somebody might tell them about Jesus and they might receive him in their life. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Then I'm just going to ask you to step out and come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, I just pray that you would do a mighty work. Father, I know right now Satan's already trying to rob and steal the victory. But Father, I pray that you would put a hedge of protection around this place. That your spirit would work in a mighty way in the hearts of your people. And Father, that they would come and give you whatever you're asking them to. And then Father, I pray for those that are lost today and they've never received you in their heart. That they would come, Lord. And there's some that have received you, but maybe haven't followed in believer's baptism. Lord, I pray that you'd give them the braveness and the boldness, Lord, to be able to step out and follow you. Father, I just pray that you would help us to pray for those that are lost. Pray for our community. Pray for our church, Lord. 
that we would become who you want us and made us to be. Father, we give this time over to you and these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.